I'm speaking with Bethany C. Morrow, author of A Song Below Water, being published by Tor Forge, um, coming out June 2nd, 2020. So, um, so first, uh, considering as a writer, I'm sure you have a lot of ideas in your head. Um, can you tell me first a little, uh, briefly what the book is about and how this particular idea rose up above the rest? So A Song Below Water is um, a contemporary fantasy young adult novel about two sister friends, which is, you know, um, black girls who are close enough that they are considered sisters and everyone considers them sisters, um, who live in Portland, Oregon, but it's an alternate Portland, Oregon, in which there are magical and fantastical creatures, not just in Portland, but the story is set there. And uh, one of the girls is a siren in a world where sirens are only black women, Mm -hmm. uh, which accounts for them being mistrusted and um, silenced. And that it it creates, there's a network within the black community that's sole purpose is to protect sirens from being found out. Mm -hmm. Um, And the other sister, Effie, is becoming something and she's a cosplay mermaid in a renaissance fair Hmm. but um something is clearly going on with her and so it's basically a story about uh, in in addition to all of that the real story for me is about black sisterhood Hmm. um the way that this story stood out i guess is because of why it came to be in the first place um i have many siblings actually but um i am especially close with my sister, Jennifer, who lives in Portland, actually. And we were on Twitter in the DMs, as we are wont to be, and um, something was going on in the timeline. Right now, um, there is an amplification happening for Black women's voices online, and people have a very, very, very short memory. So if you look at it right now, people are like, oh, yeah, this is great. Black women are being amplified. Number one, ignoring all of the vitriol and the doxing and just the unique... um, attack that comes with being a black woman online and having an opinion. Um, But just a couple of years ago, it was, I mean, it was even worse. We've always lived in a dystopian wasteland, black women have, so it's just a surprise for everybody to finally be catching up with us. But someone was being, someone's entire, you know, identity and worth was, was being disparaged or something over something that the person said. And in the DM to my sister, I wrote um, sort of, you know, not jokingly, but just sort of uh, sardonically or whatever I was saying, like, my voice is power in terms of how am I both hated and meaningless, but also warrant all of this vitriol, right? Mm, yeah. um, and obviously the answer being because my voice is power. And then we just kind of continue talking. And then I was like, shut up, wait a minute. Mm. What if our voices really our power um, and no one can resist it. And what if it's because we're sirens and what if only we are sirens? And then it was like, well, I guess I have to write this book now. Hmm. Interesting. That's pretty cool. Uh, I mean, not cool what you know, <laughs> the, the, the problems, right. but the way you came right. up with the idea is really, really uh, interesting. I know with fantasy novels, so this question might sound odd, but um, I'm curious how much research you did for the book. And sort of the specific thing. So first, uh, the mythology angle, you know, sirens. Um, was that already something that you had going on, um, you know, as far as your experiences? Or did you research, you know, the mythology? And um, I I didn't actually even... So, so I've never written contemporary fantasy before this. And it was basically necessitated by what the idea was. And the fact that, of course, I was talking about the real world we live in. And so there was no way that I was going to set it in sort of like a second world setting mm-hmm. when I'm literally talking about what black women face in real life. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's contemporary fantasy, which doesn't mean you wouldn't do... Um, I don't want to make that sound as though that's why I didn't do any research. But because... I was writing sirens for a particular reason. I was completely disinterested in what anybody else thinks sirens are. Mm, Um, For one thing in this book, sirens and mermaids, there's no relation whatsoever. Sirens are uh, land dwelling black women. Mm. It has solely to do with this, um, you know, supernatural power in our voice, but also in where our voice goes, where the power of that voice goes once we die. So, you know, that's, somewhat related to the idea of their, you know, your voice returning to the sea or something returning to a body of water, although it's not literally that. Um, 
I didn't keep any mythology. Um, the, all of the mythos in the book, it, you know, it, it might obviously be related to something, but it's it's not meant to fit in with any existing mythos. So um, one of the issues that I had was as a non-white person writing contemporary fantasy, I really didn't want to have to play in the same sort of sandbox that, that we always are shown, always given, and all stories are um, presented to us. And because I am largely and, and for the most part, completely omitted from all of that stuff in the first place. Um, so when even thinking about uh, mermaids, I was thinking more of Mamuwata and that's sort of the visual um, interpretation and inspiration that I was using. I, I use Pinterest almost exclusively now when I'm in an in inspiration stage and I just have boards for each book or something and, and different pictures that I want to keep looking at and sort of musing on while I'm while I'm working. But there's also, I wanted to introduce um, mythos that had nothing to do with Western mythology. And um, and so I wanted to use a loco, but especially as a diaspora writer, I didn't want to use a loco as they're actually used. Um, because one of the things that you are able to do because of how prevalent Western mythology is, is it's totally acceptable for you to sort of, you know, reimagine aspects of it without really introducing that to the reader we just pick up on that very quickly we're used to we're so familiar with this stuff that it's like yeah if you if you make changes i can say okay well this is rick riordan's story of such and such and this is uh you know krista wolf's story of such and such and and it's it's you're allowed a sort of freedom and creativity with it because it's taken as you know like a legitimate thing that we're all expected to know mm -hmm. and while we don't all know you know central african uh, folklore and I particularly don't um, or didn't. I wanted to use a mythological creature that didn't come down through Western literature. So I used a loco and I did do research on a loco and then I decided to do something completely different with it um, than is originally done, including, as you can hear, not pluralizing it correctly. Um, the plural of a loco is baloco, mm -hmm. but in in my book, the plural of a loco is a loco. Okay. Um, and it's, for me, it's supposed to be a hint to any reader who would know what it is that this is not that, but also that this is like a diaspora telling, which I've talked about before, the telephone effect um, of what it means to not have a direct connection or link to, you know, the continent, but be descended of it. Mm -hmm. And so we have our own we have our own interpretations of it, whether it's by mishearing, whether it's, you know, just by the evolution that goes on f through an oral tradition. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of a call to that. It's sort of a call back to, you know, perhaps this was originally told as it was intended. But by the time it gets to the West Coast of the United States in 2020, it's, you know, this is what it's become. Mm, OK. Uh, what was it? You used the term memoata. I'm not familiar. Mamiwata. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um she's like a mermaid and uh actually i i believe sierra leone um has the mythology of mamiwata i don't know if it's only uh sierra leone but um and it's more of a more of a malevolent sort of um actually when i was on a panel recently uh with an author named namina and i'm blanking on her last name right now um she was talking about her love of mamiwata when she was a child in sierra leone and and people warning children if you don't, you know, because they live near a marshland, like if you don't do what you're supposed to and you don't behave or whatever, Mommy Watson's going to come for you and how she was really disappointed that Mommy Watson never did. Hmm. So it's, again, still quite different from what you might think of when you when we think of mermaids. Although, I mean, I guess if you watch like, you know, the animated Peter Pan, mm -hmm. the, the mermaids are pretty immediately are sort of uh, have a malevolent side to them or at least a jealous side, I guess. Mm -hmm. Nami now Forna? Yes, yes, Forna. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the Gil I guess she wrote The Gilded Ones, or it's coming yes. out. Okay. It will be coming out next year. I'm speaking with Bethany C. Morrow, author of A Song Below Water. You can find her at bethanycmorrow.com. Please rate this podcast on whatever podcast feed you're listening to it on. These ratings go a long way in increasing my listenership. Please sign up for my newsletter located at 
chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. Please post your comments about this podcast or the episode on Facebook at Chris Alvarez FCN or on YouTube at Chris Alvarez. You can contact me directly on Twitter at Chris Alvarez FCN or on Instagram at Chris Alvarez Sci-Fi. If you like military history, please listen to my podcast, Military History Inside Out, located at warscholar.org and militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you like outer space business, technology, and policy, please listen to my podcast, Spacewalks Money Talks, also located at spacewalksmoneytalks.com. I appreciate any support you can give me. Now back to the podcast. So, so this might sound like an odd question, but so I'm perfectly familiar with the vitriol against uh, black women and such from, you know, different aspects of, of American society. But did you, um, do you, are you on online forums or, or anything where you've, you've seen more of this, um, because of your status as an author or, you know, yeah, I'm on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Okay. (laughs) It's Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, it will happen anywhere, and I've, I've been on different forums for different things, particularly fandom forums and stuff, and dear God. Um, uh, but Twitter is a pretty prime example uh, of watching it in real time and having even people who parrot things like believe black women and listen to black women um, sit there and watch it, and there's no good reason. There's always like, a, oh, well, I... I think there's two sides to this, and, and it's amazing. It's amazing to watch people justify behavior um, that they have that they have had no problem criticizing and demonizing and saying this is completely unacceptable. And then for some reason, when they're watching it happen to a black woman, then it's like, A, either she's, and this is one of the big problems with the mythology around black women, um, which is supposed to sound like a compliment when it's like, oh, you're so strong, but that's not. That's like pretty much an alert that we're going to heap abuse on you and it's okay for us to do because you're so strong, you can take it. Mm. Um, So when this stuff is happening to black women specifically, people are like, she's okay. Is she? How do you know? And that's actually where you saw stuff start happening like hashtag like, are you okay, sis? And different different things where people are, you know, we're, we're bringing attention to the fact that like, you need to understand that we are human. We're actually human beings. Mm -hmm. I don't know what people think we are. I don't know why, you know, it's pervasive, but if anybody that you do this to, there's no such thing as like creating a narrative by, you know, whereby it's like, this is perfectly acceptable and this person can take it. And it's different than if you were to do it to someone else and we are not as quote unquote sensitive or whatever. Well, we're human. Mm -hmm. So, it's abuse. Um, would you say, so the book, I see the book, you know, the, the age range it gives in the description is 13 to 18. Uh, yeah, it's young adult. So would you say, so with these issues, do you think there's anything you tone down for younger readers as far as what you're discussing? Or did you, or do you just, was there any kind of self censorship for any reason? Or is it just all out there? Absolutely not. Not in terms of what black women experience, because I wouldn't need to because black teenage girls are treated the same way. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of times when you write young adult, I write adult and young adult. And when you write young adult and the protagonists are black girls and particularly when it's a when it's a story that is actually centering and catering to black girls, Mm -hmm. a lot of the quote unquote criticism you'll get is, well, this kind of reads too adult. And the funny thing is, that's not a criticism of the work. That's a criticism of the way that the world views black girls Mm -hmm. um, and what black girls therefore have to go through that for someone else would, would be deemed, okay, this isn't an adolescent issue. Well, it is if you're a black teenage girl, Mm -hmm. Uh, because you're, you're, you know, we've been, we've been adultifying black girls since they're about six years old. So, uh, and we already see that in a, in a bunch of studies, we see it in the educational system. You know, you see how black girls are assumed to be adults where white girls are are children so a lot of times people will say like oh this reads so mature and i'm like that should tell you something about the quote-unquote adolescent period of being a black girl so now there is in the in a follow-up book which isn't a sequel to it but it's related it's in the it's in the world Mm -hmm. there's something that i specifically chose not to put on the page um explicitly and 
that is because of of what is happening and who it's happening to. And when I'm writing young adult, I'm very I am very intentionally it's for the purpose of speaking a word of edification or empowerment to specifically black girls. It's, you know, everyone can read it. It's for everyone, but it's to black girls. So um, if I choose not to do something, it is literally because I understand that this thing is a harmful thing specifically to the group that I'm speaking to, specifically to whom I want to be writing. And so if I censor anything, it won't be the content that they're familiar with that, that actually, you know, that they go through that they would need to see to know that this is this is actually talking to them. Um, but but there was uh, something where I didn't want to show a particular harm being done to a very young black girl because I want the world to understand this, this is actual harm. This is actually um, painful. And while literature and film and everything sometimes, um, not sometimes, much of the time, likes to bask in basically trauma porn, um, for us, this is this is this is real stuff. This is this is real stuff that can actually happen to us. It's not entertainment. It, it shouldn't be the only thing that lets somebody know. Oh, this is an authentic story, and I know it is because I was able to make this girl bleed. Um, in that way, there's a difference when I'm writing young adult versus adult. But in terms of what I set out to write in in a song below water about massage noir, I didn't I didn't need to tone it down because. It's it's just the air we breathe. It's everyday life, whether you're 13 or 30. Mm -hmm. I guess one thing that comes to mind is, um, you know, do you have do, do you end up working with sympathetic editors who understand where you're coming from? You know, is it you know, because sometimes you don't get to choose, you, you know, you don't get to choose who, mm -hmm. who publishes your book. Sometimes you do. So right. I don't know if you want to. Um, in, in this case, you know, we were able, I, you know, specifically wanted to uh, work with Diana Foe at, at Tortine. Um, and obviously there's a difference between, I think people like to broaden things and say women of color, but when you mean black, just say black. Um, and it is very different. I've never had a black female editor. Let me put it that way. Um, that doesn't mean that I have never had a sympathetic uh, editor, but I've never had a black woman editor. So, um, I know that there would be a difference. There are times that people don't know what they don't know. And that's anybody, uh, who does not have your lived experience. Um, what's important is the person understanding that I know, and I don't need to prove something to you. And a lot of times it would be like, what I loved about working with Diana is she would ask something like there was a point where she was like, Hey, do you want to, and the other thing is very, very, um, respectful and like, um, and aware as somebody who is concerned with honoring and um, and not doing harm to marginalized creators, uh, that in itself makes the way that she approaches things that she's not even sure if this is an editorial issue or, or if this is a cultural thing that she needs to respect. Mm -hmm. And the way that she approaches me and the way that she talks about it is always, uh, I've always been comfortable with Diana. Um, I think she does an amazing job of that. But there would there was a time like uh, that I was asked, would you, would you want to kind of explain briefly in the text what a sister friend is? And I'm like, absolutely not. Because mm -hmm. as soon as I explain what a sister friend is, the black girl that's reading the book knows I'm not talking to her. Right. Yeah. So one of, one of the things about inclusion in publishing is there's something for everyone, not everything for someone. And people have to appreciate that what that's going to feel like is the discomfort of no longer being the center of my attention and no longer being the, the target audience for every single book that comes out. That doesn't mean you can't read it, just like we've been reading stuff forever that wasn't for us. Um, I mean, it's just get literate. It's just a, it's literally like a point of literacy. I am fluent in things that are not for me, not about me. I'm able to connect. I don't get to say like, well, well, I can't connect to this. Well, then I guess I would have had very little entertainment and very little media to interact with if that were the case. Yeah. So, um, you know, that discomfort of recognizing that like, okay, I am not fluent in this culture. And I know that because when I'm not centered, there are things I don't understand. Um, but I don't need to explain that on the page just because someone else doesn't understand it because it would shift who the target audience is for my work. And a huge point for me is that black girls know I am talking to black girls. Um, so there are certain things that of course I'm not going to, I'm not going to say because it will make, it will, it will alert them to the fact that I'm talking to, you know, the quote unquote default 
reader next to you. Um, so that is something that you go through when when you're working with somebody who, of course, doesn't share your lived experience. Um, it's not. Here's the thing. I mean, I'm quite accustomed to that because that's typically the case. Um, but of course, there are there are things that it's like, OK, I'm not going to work with someone who does this. Like I tweeted yesterday, you know, something about like if you edit a publication and you decapitalize my use of black as in black American uh, because of a quote unquote style guide, you can go ahead and lose my number. Um, that's that's just completely unacceptable. You're never going to be able to hide behind this supposedly unbiased, you know, criterion where you're like we would you know i totally understand that this is about your identity and humanity and stuff but i have to adhere to this to this style guide like if you don't understand like the inherent violence in that we don't have anything to talk about so yeah Hmm. there is definitely a sense of like of course there will always be um there will always be times that i for one because i my dignity matters a lot more than someone else's feelings and opinion that i will have no problem being like, okay, I guess we can't work together because I'm not going to, A, I'm not going to always like take up my emotional, intellectual energy explaining something to someone that they could be aware of if they were not solely focused on themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and I just, I should, I I don't have to, and I'm not going to, and I'm not waiting for somebody's permission to tell me I don't have to. I told myself I don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. No, I get that. Um, so the book is set in Portland and uh, Portland, Oregon, and you said your sister lives there. Is that so? I'm just curious why you chose Portland. Anything beyond <laughs> that, or something else about Portland? Oh yes, oh yes, Portland. So my sister has lived there. She's been raising her her five boys there for over ten years at this point, and I've spent a lot of time with her there. We are originally from Northern California, and I knew oh. that I was going to write. Uh, if I was going to write young adult, I knew that I was going to speak specifically to, again, black girls on the West Coast, because it is a very specific experience. It's a very specific experience of being gaslit. It's a very specific experience of like, very uh, progressive racism. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's all of that's all of the West Coast, but specific to Portland, Portland is such a strong personality. Portland is very self-congratulatory about exactly how progressive they are. And just like being in Portland and hearing, like literally hearing white people talk about how amazing Portland is and then looking around and recognizing that it is like the whitest city (laughs) in the country. And like, but to hear them talk about it, to hear people talk about it, particularly when you're physically in Portland, it's like, look at us we're doing you know that paul rudd meme look at us yeah <laughs> look at us who like well how did we we're doing it we're, we're really doing it and the funny thing is like i'm standing right here you're not asking me if it feels like that to me right. like you're, you're you're not asking me what the experience of being in portland is for me you're informing me like mm-hmm. you're informing me that it's this amazing you know just like bastion and like sanctuary city of progressiveness mm-hmm. we're not even going to talk about the militias in the state of Oregon and the terror that they have enacted or anything. Let's just, let's ignore all of that. And let's just talk about how perfect and amazing and progressive um, Portland is and, and how they, what they really value. And anytime you have a place that is overwhelmingly white anywhere in this nation, like legit anywhere in the United States, Mm -hmm. I want people to understand that that is an intentional thing. Now that's not difficult to prove with Portland. Just go look at the laws, go look at the, the the literal like segregationist laws, um, and how long they were on the books and what things are actually still not technically undone or overturned. And then remember that it is as far West as you can go. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's pretty interesting, but just anytime you have a population that is overwhelmingly white in a country, um, that has so many different racial ethnicities, um, and nationalities, you have to ask yourself, how did it get that way? And how does it stay that way? More importantly, um, and you show people if they're actually, if they're actually uh, welcome somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, growing up in in California, not only are you privy to, now I I was born in a blue state, right? But if you live in Sacramento or in Northern California, you basically live in a red zone in a a blue state. Mm 
Mm-hmm. So your lived experience is like you're living around a bunch of people who would, you know, who would vote for Trump. And mm-hmm. um, and all the while being told, like, aren't you lucky? <laughs> Isn't this, aren't you happy to be here? You should be really grateful because mm-hmm. you could be, you know, insert whatever place they have never been but think is a worse place. Um, because, of course, there are degrees to terror, apparently. And I should be happy that I have this particular kind of terror, even though it's day in and day out, and it's unrelenting, and it's completely like um, disarming and, and alarming a lot of times because you could, you know, you could grow up and go to school and be friends with people for years before you heard something that would have been a red flag that you probably would have heard day one if you were somewhere else, yeah. um, and would have been able to like protect yourself against emotionally by not getting attached to the person, but like. Uh, it's something very specific. It's an insidious form of, of racism that is that is very specific to the West Coast. And then again, like I said, there was something quite specific about Portland itself um, and how I feel when I'm in Portland that I wanted to speak to the kids because there are kids growing up there mm-hmm. um, and, and speak to them and, and acknowledge, if nothing else, that, yeah, I, I understand that this is this is the climate you're growing up in and you're you're sort of gagged in in terms of like speaking on it because as soon as you do somebody of course wants to do that sort of like relative racism argument yeah i'm familiar with what you're talking about i i have close friends who relocated from dc east coast areas and and live out there so Mm -hmm. yeah i'm i'm familiar with what you're talking about I know I'm sure some of my listeners will be surprised to hear what you said, but uh, they shouldn't. They shouldn't be. <laughs> they really shouldn't be. And I, I'm always alarmed when people are surprised because it's well, it's the same thing as having to say like, "Hey, welcome to the United States of America." And I'm losing patience with people who are really devastated because I'm like, if you're devastated, that means that my terrorization impacted you not at all, and that's mm. pretty unacceptable. So yeah. So as far as both the fantasy and also the social issue aspect of your book, um, what would you say are some of the things, uh, books, movies, TV, et cetera, that uh, have inspired this work? Um, I never talk about things as having inspired the work uh, unless it like legit did. Like there's a, you know, like there's a short fuse that like I can see the connectivity obviously as a student of sociology and I say this a million times on a daily basis it seems I understand that our imaginations do not uh come to be in a vacuum but at the same time we sometimes steal the autonomy of artists by assuming that there's like a direct inspiration which in my mind is a sort of like derivative um accusation or something but um I would say, if anything, it comes wanting to do contemporary fantasy was based on the story that I'm telling. And that's sort of always if I ever write something I've never written before, particularly in a genre that I've never written before. Mm-hmm. Um, it's always because it, it th- that is what that's what the story was. I, I don't set out to go. I would like to write a contemporary fantasy. So let me figure out a story. It was basically if there are black sirens and they live in present day Portland, that's contemporary fantasy. Mm-hmm. Um and so that then dictates, of course, how the story unfolds. Um, but if anything, it would be the huge void in what I would consider sort of contemporary fantasy or contemporary fantasy adjacent media. Mm-hmm. Um, so the first thing is that people, because it's a black girl and because I'm a black girl, maybe are like, oh, this is urban fantasy. And I understand that we think that urban is like the 90s polite word for black, Um, (laughs) but it's not. Urban fantasy is something else. (laughs) Um, But I do watch, of course, a lot of uh, fantasy. I probably watch way more fantasy than I actually read. I I tend to read science fiction and literary fiction and stuff. But um I would say that growing up and loving stuff and then realizing that you had no representation in it whatsoever um, definitely inspires me to uh, want to give specifically teenage black girls representation in in fantastical worlds and in fantastical settings and stuff and obviously make it authentic to them, but also have it be fun and joyous and everything else like their life actually is. Because like I said, it's not, your life isn't just a marathon of trauma porn for somebody else's benefit to feel like, Oh, you know, there, but for the grace of God. Um, so I can't think of a specific title, but I mean, you know, if you just 
if you think about the the kind of stuff that's been on television, uh, some of which, of course, is more like paranormal or urban fantasy or things like Buffy or whatever. Um, like, was there a reason why that was like all white people? Who knows? Um, you know, but yeah. stuff like that where, where you're like, where where was I and why? Like, why was I not? Or if you think about the treatment of uh, the sole black character who, if, when they do get put in those situations. So, like, I didn't watch Vampire Diaries, but I'm very familiar with Bonnie's situation. Um, I didn't watch all of, and I didn't read, what is it called, um, True Blood, but obviously there's the issue of the treatment of Tara. I think her name was Tara. I did watch a lot of of uh, True Blood, but it just got exhausting because it was, you know, there's always the, the, the best friend whose value just seems to fluctuate wildly. Like, sometimes she has a storyline, and sometimes you could just forget that she exists. Mm-hmm. Um and then the things that happen to them tend to be for the benefit of another character. So they're not even treated like they're actual people. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say that that sort of thing is something that I'm constantly criticizing and indicting with my work. But obviously that's not from like a story or like thematic aspect specific to like the stories I'm trying to tell. It's, it's simply the awareness of what needs to change in terms of representation and what inclusion actually looks like and that we are not foil characters. I'm speaking with Bethany C. Morrow, author of A Song Below Water. You can find her at bethanycmorrow.com. Please rate this podcast on whatever podcast feed you're listening to it on. These ratings go a long way in increasing my listenership. Please sign up for my newsletter located at chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. Please post your comments about this podcast or the episode on Facebook at Chris Alvarez FCN or on YouTube at Chris Alvarez. You can contact me directly on Twitter at Chris Alvarez FCN or on Instagram at Chris Alvarez Sci-Fi. If you like military history, please listen to my podcast Military History Inside Out located at warscholar.org and militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you like outer space business, technology, and policy, please listen to my podcast, Spacewalks Money Talks, also located at spacewalksmoneytalks.com. I appreciate any support you can give me. Now back to the podcast. So apart from the book then, what uh, what are some of the, the things you enjoy? And you mentioned sci-fi. I'm curious what in sci-fi. And I also saw you wrote an article about why why I stand Planet of the Eight. Yes, I just, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so I just um, feel very strongly about Planet of the Eight. <laughs> um, yeah, I just I absolutely love the Planet of the Apes, and I have to always be like really clear. I'm not saying that I love Planet of the Apes because it's good. Okay, mm-hmm. I love Planet of the Apes because you're just born to love certain things. Um, the original five from the from the first franchise and the three Andy Circus films. Mm-hmm. Anything else that may or may not have ever been produced by, for example, Tim Burton doesn't actually exist it's trash so um i'm only talking about the original five starring roddy mcdowell and then uh andy circuses and just watching being familiar i i understand that you don't actually have to be familiar and especially not as familiar as i am with the first five movies but there was just something so satisfying about watching the new trilogy when you are familiar um Oh, it was just so wonderful. I absolutely love it. Aside from which, I think the Andy Serkis trilogy of Rise and Dawn and and War are probably the most emotionally satisfying trilogy I've ever watched. Hmm. Um, oh, gosh. Just so I can't even I'm getting for I can't I don't know how to properly describe it. But do read that <laughs> article on tour.com if you haven't read it, because um, if you thought that you couldn't write a comparative analysis of two arguably one minor character from a franchise and then tie it to a contemporary franchise, you would be wrong. I did. And I greatly enjoyed it. Um, I also love the expanse. I mean, like, I think it's probably the best. I think it's probably the best science fiction TV show that's ever been done ever. Um, And the funny thing is I started reading the books and the book, 
the the first book honestly it's this is probably very personal to the way that i read but it read like fantasy to me like it didn't read like science fiction hmm. and i won't even try to go into what that is with your viewership lest i horribly offend somebody but the point is it was not for me uh but the television show is so so amazing i absolutely love it um i love star trek i i've watched discovery i I absolutely detest time travel um, stories because of the, just just acknowledge that it's fantasy. Like, stop trying to pass it <laughs> off as as science fiction or something because there's no logic that will ever make it make sense. Like, they even properly explained the problem with time travel, like in an Avengers movie, and then they went ahead and did something that completely broke. Like, okay, so so Captain America comes back or lives through his life as a normal human being and ages and stuff. Right. But the time that he was going back to was after the experimentation. Right. So like, why was he suddenly able to age or whatever? Anyway, my point is, and then the other thing is like, so now we sent him back and he came directly back forward through this time like that. It doesn't make anyway. Anyway, <laughs> the point is I hate, I by and large, I hate time travel. Um, because it's just so easy to, to completely like tear apart. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I do love Star Trek. I did have a huge problem with like the last two episodes specifically of Discovery it was like, no, stop. Um, but I love Michael Burnham. I'm obsessed. Um, absolutely love a lot of that stuff. I, I had a huge problem with um, Tyler's experience. There was some just like the sexual violence that just kind of got normalized some point through his through his um his journey or whatever i was kind of unsure why you would make that choice yeah. um i love black lightning yeah there's i mean there's a lot of stuff i, I love watching science fiction i love reading science fiction and i i'm still very obsessed with um a book called containment that i read by christian cantrell which is an independently published um or might have been self-published book uh, and it is it's so good it's probably i don't tend to really like huge tomes because I'm like, okay, prove to me that you need that word count. But I personally, <laughs> the funny thing is when I read science fiction, I really like, for some reason I have like an affinity for kind of like sterile, just very like unemotional science fiction. And I guess like quite hard science fiction. So it just, it hit all of my buttons. I absolutely loved it. And then of course I love speculative literary fiction, especially by um, black authors like Riot Baby uh, is the last thing and maybe only the second book that I've ever like literally cried. Um, and just been like, it was so good. Uh, zone one by Colson Whitehead is huge. Octavia Butler. I don't really have to even, or shouldn't have to go into, um, native tongue by Suzette Elgin, which was, uh, brought back into print a couple of years ago by feminist press. Uh, which is kind of like the predecessor of uh, Handmaid's Tale, but obviously like, m but actual science fiction. Um, there's a lot of stuff. I, I love science fiction. Science fiction is kind of like my, is more my home. It's it's either like Toni Morrison and James Baldwin and Zora Neale Hurston and like, you know, you know, literary fiction and stuff or mm -hmm. science fiction. And when they come together as within like, like with uh, Colson Whitehead and stuff, then it's like, that, that's absolutely magic. Do you, do you remember how old you were and, and what piece of work you were first exposed to in this in these genres? Well, I grew up with a family that religiously watched Star Trek, so I have, like, mm -hmm. no... Uh, it, people are like, oh, how, when did you know you liked science fiction? I was like, well, first of all, I thought everything was science fiction because that's, like, everything that we consumed. Um, in terms of reading, I was born in the early 80s, and... So obviously I went to elementary school and stuff in the 80s and then and then uh, junior high school and stuff in the 90s. And I read a lot of like Lois Duncan and Christopher Pike, which I talk about all the time. And the great thing about them was like, I don't think we had, I think we had juvenile fiction in my school library, but I don't remember where stuff was like in, in the public library and stuff. But it also didn't have, they couldn't place these things like within genres. It was just everything like Christopher Pike specifically. It was just, you'd be reading a story and then at some point randomly you realize that this person is actually a robot. And um, so I was, I, I, it was sort of always like, I was always reading stuff where it, it was all present. It was like very mishmashed, 
mm-hmm. sort of before stuff had to be. But then I was also reading like um, Asimov short stories and stuff like that. And I remember that happening where we were assigned. We started being assigned that stuff in elementary school at some point. Mm-hmm. And I just remember this short story about a family that's like afraid of the rain. And they go to like this state fair with their new neighbors or whatever. And um, and the family is like kind of grossed out because all this family eats is like cotton candy and and the, including the parents and stuff. And they're like, this is really weird. That's so gross. Uh, but then when it looks like it's supposed to start raining, they get like really freaked out and every, I have no idea what the name of the story is, which is why I'm just explaining it. <laughs> um, and, uh, and the family is like, you'd think they were made of sugar and afraid to melt. And then of course they are made of sugar and they did melt. It was amazing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that kind of stuff. I mean, I was always, but, you know, it's at the age where you don't know that, okay, science fiction is different from general fiction is different from, yeah. you know, you don't know any of that stuff. You just know what you like. Yeah, yeah. So, um, as far as to get an idea of sort of the aesthetic or feel of, of this novel, um, mm-hmm. would you say there's, what would you say uh, the soundtrack of the book would be if it had one? It, it, would, have a, it would have the same kind of soundtrack as, as a contemporary film. I would say that... Um, it's very, it's very, very, and I don't, <laughs> I don't listen to the radio. I know that I sound very much like a 37 year old when I say that, but I, I'm sorry. It's the truth. Um, so my soundtrack for it in writing is quite different from, let's say, if it was like produced into a film or something, it would have the, I'm sure like the latest pop music because it's a contemporary fantasy about, you know, teenage high schoolers. Um, but when I write, I have like, max richter and like any sort of like chill step and you know i i I listen to a lot of ambient like post rock and uh that sort of stuff so um my my writing soundtrack would be quite different from like what the soundtrack for the story would be i'm sure okay um is there anything out of the ordinary uh that you do either writing the draft or or uh the the rough draft and the final draft for the book out of the ordinary from other writers I don't know what would be ordinary, so um, I don't know. I mean, I do sort of rolling revisions, so I don't know where the first draft ends and the next draft begins, Mm -hmm. um, because I I would never be able to. A lot of people can say, like, okay, just get it out, and then you can revise it, Mm -hmm. but I can't proceed if something is a mess, Um, so... I definitely don't like leave areas where like explain this later because it has to, it has to be, it has to exist in my brain. Like I have to know what's going on and that this is a decision that I actually believe at least at the time that I write it down is real and is effective. Um, so I definitely don't, I definitely don't, um, jump around and I don't, I don't allow it to be, and it's not that I I think it's wrong for other people. I would love, I'm glad that people can do that. I'm just saying that I personally can't knowingly write something that I'm like, this isn't actually good enough. Um, Mm -hmm. So when I start writing, a lot of times I will have, I wrote a blog about it some years ago and it's still like largely true. As long as I have the, the first you know, piece of music, that's going to be my writing soundtrack, which always has to sort of capture the, the, voice of the story or the emotional sort of uh tone of the story and then um again I'll, of course i'll have a a character and of course i'll have like an inciting incident and that sort of thing like i'll typically write the first chapter and then i'll try to write the query um just to you know test that this is actually a book mm-hmm. um and that this is actually going to have like a narrative arc and everything. And then, um, which it never, I mean, I've never gotten to that point and been like, oh, this isn't a book. So I don't know if that's why I'm doing it, but in my mind, that's why I'm doing it is to like make sure that it actually has enough tension and everything to be um, a novel. And then um, I won't really plot out. I'll usually have in my head like, okay, this is the climax and this is the resolution. Um, but I won't have any anything sort of between those except just like moments that I know because I know the character or whatever. And so after I write the first chapter, I'll I'll go through and I'll write like the let's say act 1 with just organically like as it as it happens. Sometimes obviously I'm making notes and stuff, but I'm not I'm not 
making a, an outline and then writing it. And then after I write um, Act One, I'll stop and I'll go back and I'll read it as though just like you're reading a book or whatever. Um, and obviously see if this makes sense and what is this naturally leading to. And then and by that time, it will have started to require things. Um, and, you know, I've basically just had like in the foggy distance, like the beacon of this is the, you know, this is the climax. And uh, after I write act one, I will tend to actually have more things plotted Mm-hmm. between then and the climax and then i'll go back again and and read it at, basically at every major point for me i i stop and i read the book um mm, okay. and and then i and then i proceed so by the time i get to the climax everything after that it, my brain is pretty much like the book is done so it's actually like the hardest part to get myself to write but it's because you know every you know you know it you know exactly what's going to happen yeah. and so in my brain it's like no we finished the book i'm like but we didn't though because it has to actually be on the paper um so i don't know if that's i'm sure some people do it the same way it's just it would be difficult to say like oh yeah this is out of the ordinary because i have no idea how we establish like what the ordinary is mm-hmm. okay um, has your approach to writing changed over time? Or how has um, it? I don't think that my approach to writing, because I don't think I like have an approach to writing, uh, but my process has definitely um, changed from project to project. And like I say, like I'll be like, I will absolutely evangelize about what is the thing that is my, you know, the thing that allows me to do what I do right now. And I'll say it as though it's like forever, but just understand that I'm lying. Um, so with, after a song below water, uh, because it was a two book deal and it was like, okay, which project do I want to pursue next? And then it's, and I had, you know, maybe uh, what I always do is I, or to this point is write a first chapter, um, which I always write very short. My short, my first chapters tend to be like brief and like five to six pages, like introductory type first chapters not introductory in terms of like here's some exposition but just like an introduction for me to the character in that world like living in that world um so i have never really written synopses unless i was like querying when i was trying to get an agent and then going back after i'd written a book and writing the synopses i've always written a query like a query synopsis in order to test an idea like i said but when i needed when I wanted to decide between like three projects, like three first chapters, mm-hmm. um, I, I wrote synopses and for two of the three of them, they were super, I mean, they were like 10 page synopses. They were quite, and I guess that's part of the reason I've never, I'd never done it before. Cause it's like writing the book before you write it. Well, if I'm going to write the book, I might as well just write it. But there was a reason this time why I, I didn't have time for that. Like I needed to make the decision about what I was going to write next. Mm-hmm. And, um, once I did that, it was such a huge, like it was, it was such a huge dopamine rush, like for so long mm-hmm. that I was like on a soapbox, like you must write full synopses it's the greatest thing that's ever happened and i literally didn't do it with like the very next book but when i was in that like experience i felt like it was something i was going to do for the rest of my life and of course it's it never is um so I'm, i have like very strong opinions about my process until they change yeah um have you done other non-writing type work uh that's influenced how or what you write Um, I don't think so. I think that when I do other work, like when I write things for tour.com or like, you know, writing like a nonfiction book proposal or something, it's because this is a thing that needs a completely different format or it's a, it's a different type of conversation. So for me, it's just important to know what is this idea that I have? Is this a book? Is this an article? Is this a, you know, what is it? Is it a novella? Is it a short story? Like, um, it's just important to, and I also like how prescriptive do I want to be? And if it's too prescriptive, then obviously it needs to not be a story. Um, so just like trying to figure out what something is. And, and then I, and then I, I fo- I basically, I follow the, the idea or the kernel and like figure out where it's supposed to go. Mm-hmm. I don't think it influences the way that I do other stuff because it, 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 you know, sort of reveals itself to be something specific. So I do that. Mm-hmm. But have you done other, um, did you have other work before you got into writing or have you just been writing since, you know, since 
Really? I've always been writing. Like I've, I wrote my first, I've always been writing, but obviously like when you start out writing, at least for me anyway, it's uh, unknowingly like you you tend to, you tend to be writing, you either are writing fan fiction, which is good because it's intentional and you know that it's fan fiction mm -hmm. or you're writing something that's like, horribly derivative because it's just basically rewriting something that you love um and because of how early i started writing that's what my writing was um and that was like in elementary school um and it, again it was self-insert because it was like i love this thing but i don't exist in it mm -hmm. um so i'm just basically writing myself into a, a story that i liked um but i've always been writing so i you know, when I went to school, I did sociology and clinical psychological research and stuff. And I love forensic psychology and everything. And um, and so I was doing other stuff, but it was also because I had written since I could write. And so I, you know, not realizing or I guess not really like appreciating or respecting the fact that it is its own industry. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, that'll happen at some point. So while I'm waiting for that to happen, I don't know what I thought, like somebody's just going to like come into your house and find all the stuff that you've written. Um, <laughs> but like, while I'm waiting for that to happen, I love sociology. I love clinical psych. I'll do that stuff. And then at some point, actually, when I was in grad school in 2006, I was overseas in uh, Wales. I was like, Oh, I have to actually make this happen. <laughs> like, I actually have to do something. Um, it's not that I'd never queried before, but it was also sort of the pre-internet days in terms of querying, and that was a whole, basically like it never happened. Nobody nobody would remember that. Um, so then it became like another full-time job of just uh, research and, and learning about the industry and industry standards and trends and all that kind of stuff, not any in, in any way to like, cater to them or whatever but literally to know what people are talking about what are people writing about what are people reading uh where would what i'm writing fit so that i can become familiar with it so that if i send you something and i say because I'm, I'm sure this happens to people all the time mm -hmm. where it's like you'll say what are you writing and they're like oh i'm and insert something that's not a genre like <laughs> mm -hmm. i'm writing such and such you're like that's not a thing that's uh and so i'm not saying that that's not what you wrote i'm just saying that if you want if, if you're writing for the marketplace it matters what the marketplace would call it um, because it also matters how you approach and who you approach uh, literary agents and who represents that. And, you know, so there was the whole, that was, that's an entirely different job mm -hmm. is, is learning is the business aspect of it. Yeah. Um, something you mentioned um, considering the subject matter of this book, and then you said you were in Wales, which I, I would consider, one of those places on earth that's so totally homogenous. Um, how did you, that's my assumption. I don't know if it's correct, but um, how did you feel about the, the climate there? Um, um, I thought it was amazing because they assumed that because I was black American and they see me as American, that I would have no problem with the racism that I was witnessing. Um, I also thought it was hilarious because I'm a black American and I was living in Bangor, Wales, which is like very close to Dublin, Ireland. It's obviously in North Wales, so it's not just another sort of like, it's not like living in England, which if you're in South of Wales, sometimes it's like it's, it's there's not a huge difference. Um, so culturally, it's, it's, it is more distinct. So, you know, you're you basically, and as a, it was a uni town, so you have a lot of Irish, you have a lot of um, you don't have a lot of Welsh young people, honestly, but like, you know, you had um, older people who are Welsh and then you had um, a lot of English people and their very strong feelings about each other and expecting you to know who is who and me being like, so you guys all look related. <laughs> um, I think it's kind of a big ask that I'm supposed to immediately know, like, and my dad came over to visit and it was like literally his first two hours in Great Britain. And he asked his taxi driver if his taxi driver was Welsh. And the person just like blew a gasket. It was like, I'm English. Like, how dare you? And I was like, Oh God, dad, like, just don't ask people anything, please. Uh, because they have very strong feelings about it. And I'm like, it just looks silly to me. I'm sorry. Um, hmm. but like, but but it, again, it was like there, of course, you see the way that people talk about South Asian uh, Brits and um, and basically everyone else and black Brits and everything. But because they see black Americans as American, they think that 
well, aren't you happy that you don't deal with racism here? I'm like, but I do deal with it. I'm witnessing it. I'm looking at it. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm literally seeing how you treat people of color in your own country. Why would, why would that not impact me? That's ridiculous. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I was just curious about that. Um, huh. Interesting. Um, as far as there's the- no, there's no sanctuary just to let your, just to let your viewers know there's no sanctuary on earth. There's none. Yeah. There, there's no special place. There's no like magical kingdom. There's just places that are homogenous. And believe me, if you enter into them, there's no way to um, hide that fact. You absolutely stand out. You absolutely see things that even maybe the people who live there didn't think they would say or do. Uh, yeah. There's there's no magic kingdom. So. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Um, it's depressing. But. <laughs> Um, as far as, the, so with this book, was there much, um, was there much you had to take out? Uh, did you like write a whole bunch more than you expect to include and chop out or was it pretty much? No, nope. Um, what I wrote is in there. I'm trying to think of if there's anything that we cut out. Um, I, I genuinely, and this might also just be a problem with the way that memory works, but, uh, I genuinely don't, I can't think of anything that we took out of the book. Okay. Um, bit of a whimsical question. Um, when you were young, was there any uh, power, technology, or a fictional setting that you yearned to either have or be part of? Holodeck. <laughs> okay. Come on. Obviously. <laughs> Replicator in the holodeck. Yeah. That's, like, why? why is that not here? What's going on? <laughs> like, yes, I will use my imagination, but this is it's offensive like where's the holodeck and then also like why aren't they always on the holodeck like that makes but then also like what are the like what what are the uh what are the parameters of the holodeck you're like in an enclosed finite space but like you'll walk around you'll go through like whole city blocks or whatever and i'm like okay how big is the holodeck the other thing is like yeah it takes it's very difficult for me to just like accept something unless you like emotionally manipulate me effectively to the point that like i don't realize that this is actually like a crap story which was like with that uh with the new tron and that was mostly because daft punk did the soundtrack and so i was just like so completely obsessed that i was like this is the greatest thing i've ever seen and then like on second watch you're like oh this is trash <laughs> like story-wise this is awful yeah. but they but they got me they got me emotionally so i i didn't know for a second um but yeah i did have those questions about it but i was like I will go on faith believing that the holodeck is still amazing and I still want it. <laughs> Any particular uh, way you would use it or is it you just sample every, everything you could? I mean, why would you ever restrict it? It's the holodeck. Um, I, I love the fact. One thing I love is like we'll have like far future science fiction. But then whenever they do like a quote unquote retro thing or in the past thing, they always go to our past. And I'm like, <laughs> nothing happened between you know, the 1940s and whenever Picard is alive, like he, he, there's no other like cultural, it's like, if you start watching the uh, next generation, like we, we started watching it like o- over again from like the pilot episode mm-hmm. and they keep referring to like the great uh, thinkers of earth and stuff, but they're referring to the same people that we learn. And you're like, how much time has elapsed <laughs> supposedly since my lifetime and theirs that they're still, and that's when you see like, as a writer of science fiction, you have to be so careful about like not centering your experience because you don't even realize that this makes no sense. What, where's the music? Like, why aren't they obsessed with the song that came out? That happened in discovery. Also, at some point they had like a, they had like a dance party and they played a song from like my childhood. And I'm like, I get that the writers are my age, but it's science fiction. And this is like far future. Why? do they not have another song that's like a cultural milestone that I don't know? Yeah. Like that doesn't make any sense. Anyway, I don't even remember if that has to do with what you were asking. I'm sure it doesn't, but it's just my strong feelings about something that I love. No, no, it's, uh, um, I feel like sometimes they, they try to cover that up by saying, Oh, this character has a particular fondness for this part. of." I hate it. I hate it. It's so lazy. It's the same thing as like, this happens in young adults sometimes where it'll be like, okay, so I'm 37, right? So if I write young adult and I have a character who loves journey, then, then I'm like, 
oh, he was he was quirky. He had a thing for like for eighties and nineties, early nineties music. And it's like you can't all do that though, because we're all because it's like we're a bunch of thirty something year olds writing young adult. You don't get to do that. You can't always write the kid who happens to be into what you were into as a youth and not just acknowledge you're just you just wanted to write your childhood. Like you can't do that. It's super duper lazy. People see through it. It's obviously self insert. Like you have to be able to separate yourself and particularly if you're writing science fiction, write something fictional. Like, you know, you're, you're supposed to be able to do that. If, if you're going to talk about how this, like, spore technology works, why can't you come up with, you know, and, and my thing is, like, I'll skip it completely. I will reference cultural things that, of course, I don't put into it. I'm not writing music for my books and stuff. Um, some people do, and it's amazing. But I'm not doing that. I, that's not my ministry. So, but I won't insert something that I know into a world where it would make no sense. Come on. Like, yeah, do better. Everybody do better. Sometimes I wonder if the producers insert themselves and say, hey, you know what? We need something that uh, connects the non sort of sci-fi people to this. Or Why are we catering to people who don't do this? Right. <laughs> like she doesn't even go here. She can go watch something else. Please don't put present day music in my Star Trek. It doesn't make sense. Uh, and every time they go into the holodeck, please don't make it the 1940s. <laughs> like, that doesn't make any sense. Why would they be so obsessed with that time period? Nothing else important or interesting happened? Come on. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what's your, uh, actually, I think you said you were doing a sequel to this or what? It's not a sequel. Well, and that's a... already, we were already kind of finished with it. But it's, uh, and it's not even really a compa- I don't know what it is. Basically, it's a, it's a different character. The character does come up in A Song Below Water. Mm-hmm. It is still, of course, uh, relatively the same time period or whatever. I think it's like a year after. Um, but it's not... It's not really a sequel and it's not really a companion in that it's it's you know it's her own story and that that one comes out next year um and i won't because the first book hasn't come out i'm trying to stop myself from saying who the second you know the whatever follow-up i just keep calling it follow-up because it sounds more honest than calling it like a sequel or a companion um who it's about because i i don't want it to seem like I don't know what it what constitutes a spoiler anymore because my brain is <laughs> so beyond projects by the time, I mean, editorially beyond projects by the time I'm actually talking about them mm-hmm. uh, that I, I don't trust myself to know what would be a spoiler and what wouldn't. So that's your current project or are there other things that you're working on? No, no, I'm working on uh, right now. I'm finishing the book that was just announced um that's the other thing like timing and publishing is very is very wobbly so um the book that was just announced uh which is in the reclaimed classic series um is a again i don't like to use the word retelling because that's not really accurate but quote-unquote retelling of little women um based around a black family of sisters in 1863 during the civil war um you know because it's a universal story but we keep remaking it exactly the same way interestingly enough um and so that is of course historical is historical fiction um and it's almost like when i don't write speculative then it's still then it's like historical because on some level that still does very much feel speculative um and then what else? And then there's something that uh, I'm not in the middle of editorially, but it's the other the other last thing that I've written that I will again be working on relatively soon. So, mm-hmm. no, by the time we're talking about a book, like yeah, you're like two and three books past it. Mm-hmm. So I know we talked a bunch of details about getting uh, a song below water finished, but were there any other difficulties getting it done or published that we haven't touched on? I would say that A Song Below Water, um, it absolutely was met with far more interest than everything else that I had queried. I had also, I was also just about to publish Mem at the time, which I had done independently. Um, I was writing Black Girl Protagonists in YA in speculative fiction and science fiction and, and getting zero uh, you know, making zero headway because, like I said, we have very short memories, and we'll see what looks like a lot of you know people of color and black women authors 
in young adult fiction right now. And number one, the numbers don't even bear that out. It's it's hyper visibility. It's not it's not an actual decent representation, like in terms of like the numbers are still a complete oversaturation and over representation of whiteness in in publishing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but because we went from like none to like six it's like, oh my gosh, there's black women everywhere. This is like a golden age. I'm like, absolutely not. Um, But that's also brand new, just like brand spanking new. So when I was querying in 2010 and we were at the height of like dystopian YA fiction and it was 72 million white girls who find out that they're the savior of a dystopian universe, um, I was getting all the same feedback. I can't connect with this. I just couldn't get into this character, blah, blah. And everybody always thinks that's like some objective way to say something like that's an objective criticism and, and, oh, it's a crafting. It wasn't. Um, Hmm. It was absolutely like people were not interested in black girl protagonists unless it was set in the past or it was trauma porn. Hmm. And, um, And so there was absolutely, then you had people starting initiatives like We Need Diverse Books, um, which like Danielle Clayton is one of the co-founders of that. And and you had movements and initiatives like that. And you have DV Pitt, which is something that uh, Beth Spillan, who's an agent, um, spearheaded. And there are two things happening. Yes, there are people who are recognizing and coming to grips with it. You know, you have that annual report that shows you that the number of books with a non-human protagonist outweighs non-white protagonists in children's literature, all of them combined. Hmm. Like there are more animals or inanimate objects than there are non-white children in in children's and you can you know they publish these numbers every single year so you'll hear people again pushing back because of the hyper visibility of those of us who are actually breaking through Mm -hmm. but the the issue is still the issue it's it's never going to be enough for me if it's like oh okay well i was able to break in okay number one it took me a decade and number two it's based on literacy. We're not calling it what it is. It's people literally not being able to understand uh, anything that's not about them. It's that mean like, I'm very uncomfortable when we are not about me. So that was very, it was very, very funny to see that flip so quickly and then have everybody trying to acquire it. And that comes with problems too, because they're doing it for a reason that is not authentic or is not, um, you know, based on actually being committed to the work that it would take to allow us to tell our stories. Um, it was, first they tried just telling our stories for us and they still are obviously things like American dirt show us that, or they would want you to write what they think is your story and have really no use for anything else. So, um, you know, there, the, there were pitfalls of like making sure that you're choosing an agent who is actually, who actually like, you know, believes in your craft and your ability and and wants to be a champion for you versus now is a really good time to have a person of color on my roles. Hmm. Um, Now is a really good time to try to, um, you know, make a splashy deal for someone because again, like making it like there's some privilege to being non-white, please. Um, So it definitely has been an experience and I really don't like when people um, ignore that or are irritated with the fact that I'm, it's, we have this, uh, we have the same problem in capitalism where it's like, you know, don't, uh, don't bad mouth billionaires because don't you want to be one one day? No, you can just say something's wrong. You can just say something is toxic. You can just say something's unacceptable. So I don't care if I broke in or not, it's still a problem. Like I'm still going to talk about it. It's still an issue. It's still keeping scores of people back and, trying to pretend like it's a craft issue is just an awful and offensive eugenics argument because it's, that's not what it is. It's not that they're not ready. It's not that they're not writing great work. Uh, one of the, one of my favorite things I've been able to do is to, um, edit an anthology and introduce people to, um, non-white and marginalized creators that hadn't really broken in yet. Mm -hmm. Um, because, we exist and we've been doing the work and we've been present. We've been learning the marketplace and the industry and it's never enough because something else is at play here, obviously because white supremacy is at play here. And if, if we're not willing to acknowledge that and if it's unacceptable to say so, then you're basically just blaming us 
for our lack of access and that's unacceptable yeah yeah well put i think um yeah he said it's hard to continue you know ask like general questions considering the, the heaviness <laughs> of what we're discussing but but um so where can people find you online website social media if for some reason you wanted to find me on twitter which i would say proceed with caution um <laughs> I am at BC Morrow. I'm at BC Morrow both on Twitter and on Instagram. I, as yet, don't fully understand Instagram. So I post what I want to post, and I realize that it's, like, not the prettiest pictures or whatever or not perfectly done pictures. So it's always better when I'm just, like, reposting what somebody – some picture somebody else took of, like, my books or something. Hmm. Um, but I do – I am on Instagram – um, I am trying to do better. My publisher is trying to help me do better. <laughs> um, uh, but Twitter is where I is where I really live. Um, and I talk nonsense and things that actually matter and publishing and media and um, and dogs that are in cute poses, which is probably the last thing that I tweeted last night. It's the greatest thing I've ever seen. There's like the orca statue behind this dog who's like standing on his hind legs in the exact same position so that kind of stuff just like <laughs> necessary important like you, pe the people need to know this kind of stuff um yeah so twitter is where i am i have a website which is bethanycmorrow.com uh which will have links and uh, information about my writing whether it's on tour.com or obviously whether it's like my novels and such mm -hmm. and where people can reach out to me for appearances and when right now of course they're all virtual appearances and mm -hmm. workshops or sensitivity reads any of those kind of services you can also contact me through there people who are looking for review copies of my work can find out which person at which publisher to ask instead of asking me because i will never have that information mm -hmm. um yeah so my website is a good spot and my uh my twitter is the best place if you actually want to talk to me and i'll just spell that out for listeners so the twitter is so it's spelled b c m o r r o w and, yes and then uh bethany c morrow is b e t h a n y c m o r r o w dot com right all right that's all the questions i have do you have any any final words or thoughts i think that you should all read my books that's pretty much <laughs> yeah hey i agree just that yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for speaking with me. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening. You can find more interesting information like this on chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. You can also find the podcast on your favorite podcast feed under the title Full Contact Nerd. That includes Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. Please remember to rate this podcast. It really helps. We're on Instagram at Chris Alvarez Sci Fi, on YouTube under Chris Alvarez, on Facebook under Chris Alvarez Full Contact Nerd, and on Twitter at Chris Alvarez Full Contact Nerd. Don't forget to sign up for my weekly newsletter where I recommend newly published books. The subscription box is on my webpage. Thanks for listening and keep imagining the past, the present, and the future.